Our last presenter for this panel will be Camilo Villanueva. Camilo Omaña Villanueva is a doctoral student in English pedagogy and English literature at Murray State University. He is from Atlanta, Georgia and has an MFA in creative writing. He researches literature, English pedagogy, and TESOL, teaching English to speakers of other languages, with special emphasis on using literature in the K-12 and university second language classroom. Villanueva's recent work has centered on the obscure 19th century Charles Crocker and Japanese writers Natsume Soseki and Abe Kobo and Nakagami Kenji. He lives in Japan with his family and teaches at Nagoya Women's University and Nansan University. Today he will be joining on a today he will be presenting on a literary untouchable and the forgotten surrealist. Please join me in welcoming Camille Villanueva. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Um, so beginning with the Meiji Restoration in 1868, uh, as Donald Keane uh, notes in uh, his book about um, Japanese literature, modern literature. Uh, he says that it's uh, Japanese literature consists of books of formless, almost meaningless gossip. Uh, but Japanese literature has come a long way. It is infused with magical realism, um, a surrealist quality that is beyond any other description. Uh, you'd have to read it to know what I mean. Going back uh, to 1926 uh, is Taniz Tanizaki Junichiro's the story of Tomoda and Matsunaga. It's a Japanese, uh, Japan meets West mystery about a shape-shifting adulterer that enthralls for 60 pages, which is double the typical Alice Munro short story. I argue that Murakami Haruki uh, has roots here. Uh, he has a direct connection to one of the authors that I'll tell you about today. Um, but first I wanna tell you two stories. Uh, the first story is about a young Japanese man, a medical student. Uh, he was studying in Tokyo uh, during World War II. Um, and he had recently returned uh, to Mukaden, which is a Japanese, uh, which was a Japanese puppet colony in Manchuria. Uh, this is where he grew up. He lived there uh, when he was an elementary student through junior high. Um, and he went back to Japan to attend medical school. Uh, he was called back to Mukaden uh, when his father died. His father was a doctor um, and he became stuck in China when Japan surrendered in 1945. Um, he came back to Tokyo with his mother and when they arrived, um, the city was leveled, destroyed. Uh, this was Abe Kobo um, and Abe Kobo would finish medical school, uh, but he would never practice as a doctor. Um, he would eventually join the Japanese literary elite, but he would be seen as an outsider uh, because he was a gaichi, which is an out, outsider Japanese, someone that had lived uh, most of their life outside Japan. And I believe he's being mostly forgotten these days. Even though he won the Akutagawa Literary Award, which is the most prestigious honor for a writer in Japan. Um, and uh, he was one of the most famous living writers at the time. Um, there's not much recent scholarship on him. Uh, I believe that he, there's no question he experienced trauma when he was a child in Manchuria and this filtered into his fiction. Um, he has a fascination with barbarism uh, and depicting it. And in the 1962 Woman in the Dunes, um, his main character gets kidnapped um, by a village that's being overrun by sand. And the sand is a metaphor, I believe, for the Japanese imperialist army, which at, you know, at that time had invaded or during the war had invaded much of Asia. Uh, Woman in the Dunes is a very contradictory novel. It's about hopelessness, but it's also about hope. Um, and this is one of the quotes he says, in his wildest dreams, he could not have imagined that such barbarism still existed anywhere in the world. Um, in 2009, uh, Abe scholar Bolton uh, describes how Abe uses technology in The Woman in the Dunes as a conduit for communication between the main character and his captors. And this technology, which was actually an invention, 
uh, in the book, uh, frees him from his imprisonment. Uh, the, that's a paradox here is that Abe was a witness to the horrors of technology, which were used against humanity, both in Manchuria and in his native Japan. Uh, regarding Abe's language, um, it's like being stuck in quicksand. Um, I wanna read you, oh, I can't read you the quote. My phone just died. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but let's see, um, one second. Um, Woman in Dunes is an exploration in how society imprisons us. Uh, but paradoxically, um, it is the community that imprisons the main character, which allows uh, that character to become eventually free. Um, in another book by Abe called The Boxman, um, uh, it's about having the freedom of choice. And uh, there's a man who, who makes a box uh, with two eye holes and he travels around in it uh, in obscurity or anonymity, um, but everyone can see him. And in this way, he is an other. Um, he's, not, he's not in control of how others see him. And I wanna read you a quote from um, Abe's Boxman book. Uh, throughout the book, there are many photographs. Um, I believe they were taken by his wife uh, along with captions and um, there's one photograph of an old pickup truck that is like from the 1950s um, that is uh, uh, many, it's in a junkyard. Um, and the quote says, the false goals of those who have kept running, but who have never caught up, the night stadium where the flag still flies, but that both umpire and spectator have long since forsaken. So you can see Abe's photorealism on display. Uh, we, we focus on what the box man focuses on. Uh, Abe explores double consciousness. Uh, an example is when the box man meets a fake box man and he ends up describing himself. So uh, the box man sees another box man who he says is fake. The quote says, an eye that simply looked expressionless, an insolent eye that forced on me the role of being seen, but of not seeing. I wonder when he learned such a technique. It goes without saying that the model was myself. I was depressed. I was being seen, but was the one seen too. Um, and later there's a picture of a girl uh, being pushed in a wheelchair alongside some old men. And the caption reads, in seeing is love, in being seen, there's abhorrence. Uh, so Abe's absurdism, his use of detail uh, and explanations um, are kind of a distraction. And I believe that they help him escape from himself. Uh, Abe was an outsider in his own country. Uh, he was, like I said, he was trained as a doctor and he uses scientific knowledge uh, detail in his book as a way to approach his characters, yet skirt around them. Uh, and most of his characters, or nearly all of them are nameless. Um, Abe is very interesting. He was always interested in the future and he's known as a first science fiction writer in Japan. Uh, his work has given many labels, um, a science fiction writer, also surrealist, absurdist. Um, the next story I wanna tell you about is um, kind of my own personal story, which leads into the next writer. Uh, it was in 2007 and I was working um, in a junior high school here in Japan. And um, the school was, I didn't know it at the time, but it was filled with people who were considered outcasts. And these were uh, normal Japanese people, um, but they were outcasts from Japanese society. Um, so I didn't know it at the time. Uh, I was in the principal's office and uh, uh, there were many secure doors in order to get there. Uh, it was my first day uh, at the school. And in order to get into the office, there was um, like a bouncer at, like at a club to let me in. Um, and inside the office, there are many displays. Um, and uh, I saw some, some kids climbing onto the roof and I tried to get attention, but I ended up being locked in the room. Uh, it was like being in a prison uh, in a warden's office. Um, I worked at that school for one year 
and the school was mostly empty except for desks and chairs. Believe it or not, there were no fans or air conditioners, even in summer. Uh, there were no heaters in winter. Um, and it was a short stroll away from a Louis Vuitton store from a Ferrari dealership. Uh, but many of the kids uh, couldn't uh, pay for uniforms or even school lunch. And these children were invisible in my own city. And uh, uh, I believe they exist within structures of Japanese society. Um, you would say they live on the margins, but um, I believe that's an a incorrect term. Uh, they make up one to 2% of the population and they're scattered throughout Japan. Um, and that's what leads me to this next writer, which is Nakagami Kenji. He's the first and I believe the only uh, writer to identify with this outcast community. Um, regarding uh, Nakagami, he was also famous at one time. Uh, he, won, he also won the Akutagawa Prize uh, and he was the first person born after World War II to win it. Um, uh, his recent book, there's not a lot of scholarship on his most recent book. It's called uh, Snake Lust. Um, it was written just before he died. It's a collection of stories. Uh, the opening story is about a man, uh, much like um, Nakagami himself, who walks into the forest to find redemption. Um, Nakagami is from a place called Kumanokodo, Kum which is an ancient road through the forests of uh, Wakayama and Mie prefectures. And it links uh, the old capital of Kyoto to Edo, which later became Tokyo. So this man who walks into the forest, uh, he sees a ghost, which is his brother on a pilgrimage. And he calls out and he calls out in a Buddhist chant. Um, the Buddhist chant is also uh, compared to the hum of cicadas. Um, so whereas uh, Abe uses technology and scientific detail as a way to explore the otherness in his fiction, uh, Nakagami, at least in Snake Lust, uses uh, nature, communion with nature. Um, it's far different from uh, his book, The Cape, which was the one that won the prize in 1976. Um, and uh, Zimmerman is a, is a Nakagami scholar. She says that uh, Nakagami's people, because they're absent of fathers, usually, that they're a mate, they live in a matriarchal world. And it's interesting because Japan's a patriarchal society. So um, you can see how um, it's far different from uh, normal Japanese. Um, Fowler states that uh, far more than in the case of African Americans in the United States, Japanese outcasts have been, been rendered invisible and voiceless in majority society in Japan. And this is why Nakagami's voice is unique and should not be forgotten. Even though he, he won uh, an important literary prize, he's mostly unknown today. Um, uh, his, uh, none of his work appears in the modern Japanese um, high school curriculum. Um, Abe's, uh, only two stories of Abe Kobo's appear. Um, his masterpieces like Woman in the Dunes, um, is not on any reading lists. Curriculum theory, um, as defined by Shiro, uh, social reconstruction ideology, ideology is defined by Shiro, states that the vision of the future good society is created in response to existing social conditions. Um, understanding this vision requires that one understand society at it, as it is in order to fully appreciate what uh, society should be. Um, both of these writers described their life, their society, as it was for them, and uh, they're mostly forgotten. Um, uh, they contributed to the social commentary of their time. Um, I'm a student of English pedagogy, and I argue that these writers be put on reading lists as outsider artists, um, even though they're, they're mostly unknown in Japan. The reason is their voices are blurred out by Japanese mainstream, by graphic novels, historical TV dramas of Japan's past glory. We think of Japan, uh, modern Japan as Gundam, robots, Toyota, Hello Kitty, Pokemon, but Japan is more than this. Um, so will Nakagami and Abe continue to exist only within the particular structures of society that hold them prisoner or will they be set free to speak to the masses? <laughs> um, Mishima Yukio, 
uh, took over um, an SDF self-defense force base in 1970 uh, and um, uh, uh, made a speech about Japanese nationalism that was poorly received, and he committed suicide um, there on the roof. And um, it was quite a spectacle. Um, so it's perhaps no wonder that um, some writers in Japan, um, especially Mishima's contemporaries, could be forgotten, even though they won awards uh, when you compare them to the unspeakable antics of their peers. We, when we read texts that are on the margins, we aren't taking a field trip to their domicile. We're experiencing their consciousness, but on our terms. We gain knowledge and insight into their experience. We wonder what brought them there. And we imagine that if we also ended up there, what would have led us there? We trace our path back into our own history, and then our history merges with the other, thereby becoming part of it. And this is where the value lies in reading such texts. Oh, sorry. Thank you.